So the format of this presentation will be um, Audrey and Justin talking you through some of the, the work that's been happening in North Ayrshire. And we've got colleagues in the background monitoring the chat. So again, feel free to post questions and comment in there. And as I said, the today's webinar focuses on the theme of communities, which I'm sure you, you agree is quite a, you know, it's a very, very broad area. There's lots in there. Our speakers will explore the importance of a, of a whole systems approach throughout the pandemic and the important part that communities as a whole have played. You'll see there on the slide just some of the themes that came through the What Scotland Learned stories. Um, so there was a, it was very strongly recognised that to build back better, schools, partners and the wider community needed to work in collaboration. The pandemic brought about a collective urgency to, to work together. So again, that collaboration. Working relationships have been strengthened in all areas and sectors. Um, and there was really that emphasis that certainly schools are more than buildings, but communities made up of individuals and groups that can support each other. And schools really highlighted the significance of the wider community in supporting families and children, particularly those who are most vulnerable. So we're delighted to be joined today by Justin Jones and Audrey Sutton. Justin is 16 years old and he lives in Irvine, North Ayrshire, and he attends Greenwood Academy um, and he's currently in fifth year. For many years, Justin has been actively involved in youth work across North Ayrshire. His roles include the current sitting chairperson of the Irvine Youth Forum and as a member and signatory on the North Ayrshire Youth Council Executive Committee. All very long terms, Justin, you'll have to keep me right if I've got any of these wrong. Um, in these roles, he's been involved in a variety of food poverty, inequality and insecurity initiatives, the North Ayrshire Youth Festival, the North Ayrshire Costs of the School Day Working Group. He's a member of the Participatory Budgeting Strategy Group and the recently created Locality Steering Group. And Justin's involved um, in things nationally as well, such as the UNCRC Scots Law Bill, and he's a member of the Young People's Guarantee Panel. And we're also joined by Dr Audrey Sutton, Audrey is Executive Director of Communities and Education at North Ayrshire Council. Her academic and professional background spans education, community planning and services, national roles including presidency of the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals in Scotland. And Audrey has a particular interest in collaborating for improvement, whole system approaches, local governance, placemaking and radical kindness, which she'll go on to tell us a wee bit about in the next 50 minutes. So hopefully this will all work seamlessly. Um, as I say, it's fantastic that Audrey and Justin can join us today. And I'm going to pass over to Audrey to share her presentation and kick us off. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Susan. Um, I hope this will be the most testing 30 seconds of the hour. So here goes. So an opportunity for you to see Justin and I to see who we are. But we'll move on quickly from that, Justin, will we? And Thanks, Audrey. Okay, and I'll put the presentation up. Hello, folks. Um, it's lovely to be here, and thank you very much for the warm welcome when, when Justin and I came on today. Um, this might be a bit of an unusual way to, to go about a seminar, but what I'd like to say, first of all, is that North Ayrshire is and is very proud of being Scotland's first child-centred council. And that was a formal decision taken by the council as a whole several years ago, where we set our stall out in terms of our relationship with our young people, the importance of their voices and the advocacy role that we um, wish to continue to support them to play. And... So this would be normal for us, for Justin and I, to do a, a presentation like this together because of the, the breadth and the depth of the work that we do together with our young people. In fact, Justin and I um, were both at Joint Cabinet this morning. I wasn't involved, um, I was only there as a participant, but Jace, uh, Justin played a part in the facilitation of the sessions with the Leader of the Council and the Administration. So it's been a busy but productive day and I hope uh, we end the day in the same note. You'll be, like me, always aware that when you're asked to present to other people, it's very much um, focused on local experience. So what I've tried to do today, and Justin has done the same, is for us to try to broaden out our understanding of the learning that we've had in North Ayrshire through the pandemic 
and before and beyond to something that might be relevant to, to all of us. You'll see much of what we speak about today reflected in your own work and your own local authorities. There's no doubt about that. But maybe you would bear with us if we're allowed maybe just to shine a light on some of the particular North Ayrshire learning, which might maybe push the boundaries of your thinking in the same way that if you were doing this, you would push the boundary of ours. So with your blessing, I hope, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that's why you're here today, with your blessing, we'll, we'll maybe just um, focus in on some of what we've experienced. And please, as I say, at the end, or perhaps before if need be, challenges around any of this. So we've called the presentation today Customers to Citizens in North Ayrshire and that's something that as a local authority and dare I say as a community planning partnership and I have the privilege to be the lead officer for the, the community planning partnership in North Ayrshire. It's a journey that I think all of us have been on for a very long time. And for me, this is completely underpinned by GIRFEC and that relationship we have with our residents, including our children and young people. How do we become more to them than customers? Um, and how do we, in a sense, help to build the capacity and provide um, empowering tools and contexts for everyone to be um, as good as they can be. And that's that journey of customer to citizens. How do we treat people in the round as holistically as possible? And what did the pandemic teach us about that? So we've called it customer to citizens, and I hope that will become clear um, in the fullness of time, both from the point of view of young people and of um, the, the overall community planning experience. So I'm going to just start very quickly to give a, a reflection of how we approached the pandemic in North Ayrshire. And we're very fortunate that um, the community hub model that we developed has been something that people have um, reflected in their own practice and indeed we've learned from what other people have done. But in relation to North Ayrshire, we founded the, the model very much on our locality planning approach and on the relationship that we have with communities. And it is something we're very proud of in North Ayrshire. And I think, you know, we all rely from time to time on external approval or external reflection on what we do. And our recent best value report did confirm for us that certainly our intentionality around our relationship with communities is absolutely as it should be. The impact of that and the outcomes for people um, is always much more difficult to understand and some of what we'll talk about today will be in that more difficult territory. So you'll see there in the slide that what I've given is an indicative overview of the number of people across the system, the number of partners across the system who work together with us in the pandemic to ensure the best outcomes for our young people and our communities. And you'll see there um, that as well as individual partners, if you look at the the circle or the cycle, if you like, to the left. The components of that for us more thematically were, as you would imagine, the volunteer base, the activities that were happening in communities and that lent themselves to the response to the pandemic, the role played by council staff and council supports within each locality, and the overall community resilience provided by organisations, community planning partners and a whole range of individuals. So there's nothing there probably that isn't familiar to you. What perhaps um, for us was slightly different was that this was an intentional model led and developed by the council and supported and bought into by partners. And I suppose the strength in that for us is that we wish then, as we do now, to continue to use this model to plan our services, both at council and at community planning level, into the future. And that's indeed the journey we're engaged on today. And a number of our colleagues are here today who are involved in that work. So Angela, Pam, Donna, and from a skills perspective, and, and Justin's going to talk more about that, we have Katie, we have Stephen, um, and it's great to be surrounded by colleagues who are all on this same journey with us. So a place-based model 
a whole systems approach and something that we're taking a paper to the council on um, on the 9th of June, which shows us how the learning from this can be adapted and progressed into the future. So the importance, I think, of all of this has been the co-production perspective in this. So it hasn't fallen away. It's something that we continue to do. And the services and the support and the capacity building um, and that voice that we hear from communities, including young people, um, has helped us to shape this together. So, Just a snapshot of the kind of activity, and again, that was early on in the pandemic and the numbers have ramped up as they will have for you across the, the period of the past year or so. But, you know, just to, to show you the territory. So, hot meals in the community, food parcels, signposting to other services, money advice, um, support, for example, with cooking, health interactions, social isolation, general advice, prescription deliveries, personal visits. Again, I'm very aware that you'll all be familiar with that territory. However, I suppose the point I would like to make about all of this is um, the, the recording, the intentionality and the learning that came from that. And um, our youth team, our adult team, have developed a number of case studies in and around this territory and I'll speak a bit more about that later. But again, right from the beginning, that intentionality of how community learning and development, education, um, all of our community planning partners and our community organisations, how they came together in the understanding that we were actually shaping the future and doing something that looked and felt different. So what did we learn? Um, I'm going to approach this in quite a, an academic way, I suppose, from this perspective, because we could talk about lots of case studies and we could talk about the impact in people. And I think the time's too short today, but we're certainly happy to share these case studies with you. But what I'd like to do um, at this stage before I introduce Justin is to crystallise some of the learning that we as a Child Centred Council have derived from the pandemic and how we intend to take that forward within the organisation. So I suppose um, the, the key outcome for us as organisations and more importantly for the people we serve is that issue of having that single point of contact, that streamlined customer journey during the pandemic. So. How could we ensure that if your point of contact in a community hub or via the contact centre was, for example, um, an officer from our adult learning team, how could we ensure that everything that you needed or could be supported to do was available through that interface? So it might have been someone from housing, it might have been someone from service access teams. What we've done through the, the pandemic and the, the development of service integration has been to progress that single point of contact understanding. So that, for example, if Mrs Hegarty, head teacher at um, Justin's school, if she has perhaps an issue with a family who has a difficulty around housing all the way through to potential eviction, how can she be absolutely sure from her perspective that when she needs that wraparound support for a family during the pandemic and beyond, that that can be available at the right time in the right place? So that has been a huge focus for us during the pandemic. And Maybe other local authorities have had less to learn in that space than we had, but we absolutely had learning to do in that space. And it's taught us a lot about how we can support that um, project. Moving on, how did we collaborate behind the scenes to do that? And actually, how did we transparently collaborate during the pandemic to, to improve the outcomes for residents? Because I think there's nothing more reassuring too the people we work with than to know that we are joined up and that we can share information in a way that speeds up, um, that allows us to act at pace and allows us to share critical information about people that radically changes their situation. So we've learned a lot in that space and again, um, more unknown. 
One of the things that Susan said at the beginning of her slide was um, that change of balance between permissions and, um, I, I suppose, the concept of who does what for whom. And for us, that has resulted in a huge rebalancing. We were on that journey, but this has increased the journey of permission-driven decisions, both for our own staff across the community planning partnership, but also for the organisations that we work with. How do we change the relationship between ourselves, our young people, our community partners, um, and those who want to work with us to ensure that the decisions have been made by the right people at the right time? And by golly, has that been a learning um, experience for most of the statutory public service partners? And I'm sure you recognise that. We talk about empowerment, but, you know, how do we co-produce that real understanding? And part of that, of course, is about communication. And through communication comes trust. So that local knowledge, that local joining up of partners, develop stronger relationships to support our citizens. Our citizens are very often at the heart of that, driving that trust in these relationships. And um, communication, I think, is in every slide I've ever seen since I've been in work. But nowhere has it been clearer in terms of our learning that actually that shared understanding and that trust has been the driver rather than just the glue of the work that we've done together. And of course, I spoke about data earlier on. Um, better decisions, better decisions at pace. How do we share the right data at the right time? And we're looking at the moment at progressing at pace our sh single shared assessment approach within the council. And if anyone is, is further down that journey, and I'm sure you are than we are, we'd be desperate to hear more about how you've implemented that. But again, um, our contact centre scripts developed at pace during the pandemic. We worked together across the partnership to understand what everybody needed to know as quickly as possible. We developed that into our scripts. And again, Angela and Pam are here. They were at the heart of that work. How did we find out what we needed to find out as quickly as possible in order to improve the, the outcomes? That links to less red tape, improved response time. We had um, colleagues from service access teams within each of our community hubs and they were second to none at facilitating and speeding up access to a whole range of services across health and social care and across the, the community planning partnership. We learned a lot from them in terms of that direct route through. So how do we ensure that we do that as far as possible across all partners, including the third sector partners without jeopardising the governance and the safety of all of us in that process. So finally there, what does the whole picture look like? So our intention is an empowered and improved customer service environment in the council, but leading to that overall culture where the relationship between customers, so our children, our young people, our families, our residents as a whole, our community groups, our community anchor organisations, our community leaders. How do we make sure there's a parity of esteem in that mix informed by the pandemic, which allows us to relate to each other in every set of circumstances as citizens? And that for us has been both the research question and the research agenda for communities and education in North Ayrshire at the beginning, throughout and beyond the pandemic. So we're a child-centred council. You see in the slide again, that underpins everything. How do we take that into a space where this work is informed by young people, led by young people and continually challenged by young people? And I'm going to hand over now to Justin to talk about his experience in North Ayrshire through the pandemic and beyond, and he'll teach us what he has learned. So thank you, Justin. That's great. Thanks, Audrey. Nice to meet everybody. Um, it's great just to, to be in a room of, you know, kind of a, a national aspect to be able to engage with people and tell a bit about our story and personal experiences as well um, and how we, we've worked um, tirelessly in North Ayrshire um, to, to make 
what we have and created what we have. Um, just to give a wee bit of background to myself, Audrey, just on to the next slide, please. Um, I At the start of you know the pandemic, just before COVID, I was in my fourth year of school, starting my first year of exams. Um, you know, I was still actively involved in my communities as part of the youth forums um, at a locality level um, and also as part of the executive committee of young people as well, which we have in a North Ayrshire wide approach. Through that, you know, uh, I was involved in the youth groups across North Ayrshire, youth councils as well, which where we bring young people together in a space to target certain aspects of life, such as, you know, school days, um, climate change, transport, that kind of thing, to get their views and ideas and how that works. As a result, through all this learning and different opportunities I've been involved in, it made me want, you know, to give young people a voice, give them that voice and be that person that speaks out for them, especially especially for those, you know, that don't have the confidence to do it themselves. I've always been a quite confident person, you know, be able to go and speak to people, network with people and make sure that young people are really, really heard across the authority, whether that is locally or, at, you know, a kind of high cabinet governance level. So from the kind of youth groups when I was younger, you know, I joined the youth forum um, to which I became the chair. From the youth forum, went into the youth executive committee, and from that stemmed into national, you know, Scottish government work as well, such as Young People's Guarantee and bringing the UNCRC into Scots law. And um, you can see the kind of, you know, ladder to that, how it all stems from the bottom and works its way up, and how we actually touch the lives of young people and make sure that they are at the whole heart of what we actually do. During COVID. Obviously, the UK went into lockdown and homeschooling came around. Um, it was a different situation among young people. Young people didn't really know how to how to cope with it. It was totally different. We've been thrown in the deep end. I went as far as saying, you know, it's back to primary one. Um, you're learning how to learn again and different ways of adapting to it. Um, from a meeting I was privileged to be at just before the lockdown, um, we kind of got an understanding from the community and representatives from there that Audrey was there as well um, and what, what need is involved in the community and how that's going to look. We didn't know what COVID was going to happen. We thought, oh, it's going to be a wee three month turnaround. You know, we'll be back to school in three months, maybe the end, start start of June, uh, a push and look, look, at us, look at us now, a year, a year on and we're still battling it. But we're battling hard and we're still, we're getting there at the end of the day. So from that understanding of needing the community, uh, I knew myself that actively, you know, I need to make a difference in the community. I, I want to be there to help people and give them the help they deserve and that they really, really need. So as Audrey was talking about earlier on, that support mechanism in North Ayrshire, and I was a part of that just through the kind of local work we'd done in the, the area that I stay in and how, how we touch the lives of those that needed support through food, those that were in low incomes, um, and those that just need a chat sometimes and the lovely experiences we actually gathered from that. Another reason behind that was ensuring that the stereotype of young people of being antisocial and, you know, behaving badly, you know, they're just young, is actually challenged. And we want to make sure that, you know, young people are there, you know, that they're caring members of the community and the young people that I'm in contact with on my daily lives, you know, they, they want to be involved. And it was challenging that and showing that, you know, um, a young person involved with all these adults in a kind of, you know, social setting or but not a professional setting as well and how that works in the council and just being j jumping in the deep end, really, and how, how, how that worked between, you know, different people. And it worked well having myself there and showing that young people's perspective, I guess, and making sure that was kind of in routine at all. Throughout COVID, you know, the work that i done with the Youth Forum, we continued doing it. Uh, we created Young People's Men Mental Health and Wellbeing Isolation Packs, um, which we got through CORA Foundation from the Scottish Government. Also, we were successful in the Youth Scotland Winter Fund, um, which we're still using just now to distribute um, support me mechanisms to families and how that continues on. Online digital youth work, um, you know, picked up a lot. We wanted to engage with our young people, even though we couldn't do it face to face. We had to have that you know, support there for them as well. And also some exciting news recently is we have secured £100,000 in funding to open up a new youth hub uh, in the urban area and how that's going to look for employability 
you know, having that space for young people is really exciting as well. So all these things are, you know, coming through from what we are learning through COVID. And also as part of the exec committee, as I talked around earlier, we did a consultation on young people's mental health and wellbeing and digital access through the Get Connected survey. Uh, we've applied for funding, which we're successful with, and we've started the North Ayrshire Dash programme. Um, it is about young people's alcohol and drug dependencies, you know, how we keep young people safe. And we're not here to tell them, no, you shouldn't do that. That's not our place to do that. We're here to support them. We're here to take them on the journey and make sure they know that it's a safe space. We're here to support you and put them in the right direction. From all of this experience, again, you know, as I've said before, a privilege to be a part of and how that's came about. And I was asked to join the North Ayrshire Ventures Trust in um, building on local economic regeneration through work being done already to alleviate poverty, advance education and work to make sure young people are represented and their perspectives are included as well is important. Also through some project work, such as the cost of the school day, which was highlighted through, you know, the COVID pressures in families and their, their financial dependencies as well, therefore playing a key part in the work being done to make sure the school experience is one that's cost effective, but also a unique one and equal, which is something we like to do in North Ayrshire, you know, that equal playing field and making sure we're, we're learning from others, but having a unique perspective to it as well. On to kind of my more personal experiences throughout the COVID stuff. Um, personally, through education, it, it really gave me an opportunity to, you know, decide what I want for my future. Take a time to pause, think about pathways and how, you know, my career throughout is going to look. Taking that step, you know, to, to think about what I, what I really want to do and learning from it as well. Okay, a second-hand perspective of education as well, you know, the digital connectivity of young people and people struggling academically as well through challenges of exams and the, the changes to that and missing the valuable time that we would usually have in school. And the digital connectivity side of things is, you know, in North Ayrshire we've had a great approach to it, making sure that young people are supported as well with our digital side of education. But realising from the start, you know, that that wasn't in place and how after COVID that's going to look and how it's going to look across the authority as well, making sure young people are ready for life and have what they really need. On a mental health side of perspective, you know, personally I didn't see an effect on it myself. I was busy in the hub, you know, helping other people, focusing on that. But when I actually took the time to take a wee step back and speak to my friends about it, you know, how their mental health suffered was actually quite, it was scary. It put me in a situation where I was like, you know, well, why why haven't I thought about this? You know, I'm in a, a lucky position where I've been given the opportunity to be able to help other people, whereas other people are in the situation where they're isolated from each other and you don't know how bad the effects are of not actually been having face-to-face -face contacts. And I think we've all struggled from that and that's something we can all take on. You know, digital isn't the same as being face to face with someone, having that conversation and the digital fatigue as well and expectations to achieve in a learning style we've never known. For isolation and loneliness, young people miss their families too. You know, they miss the connections, worried about relatives and being able to have that social life as much as, you know, um, the older community might say, you know, we, we are more digital, you know, we talk to each other on our phone, we don't really see each other that much. But actually, for a young person myself, realising that, you know, we need that. We need that face to face. Also, you know, the, the blaming young people as well for being the, the rule breakers of lockdown and the, the negative only created, you know, further stigma to that. So it was about how, how do we look at that? And how do we let young people know that that's, that's happening and how, how they can change it for the better? Through poverty and inequality. Um, through the work being done in the hubs that Audrey talked about and recognising the financial pressures in people through work, furlough, and these people weren't usually financially, they were usually financially stable and it just highlighted, you know, how privileged I was in that situation that, you know, we were quite secure in income, it wasn't a problem that way and taking that step back to realise how we do take things for granted and that now we won't be doing that, we'll be looking at it and seeing how how we can, you know, be more stable in our futures. 
They added costs as well, recognising having people at home full time. I don't know about everybody else, but heating bills, um, you know, the connectivity side of things, how how that looked as well for people. And the level of need that was highlighted through dependency on people and the dependency on these hubs as well created a, a unique experience for me and the difference it's made in shaping me as a person and how, you know, how we are going to work on that and continue to do that in the future. Follow you on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So what did we do and, you know, what's going to happen next? Um, what we done was created a fully digital a youth programme gave us the time to reflect on what we need to do, change and improve. We widened our reach in young people digitally. We created the Joint Cabinet Live to create a wider reach of young people. We would usually bring them face to face, but instead having a reach of about 110, I'm sure the last one was, and bringing those young people together to get their ideas. Through these and consultations done previously, we rewrote our participation and citizenship strategy and we had to include COVID learning into that and, you know, the consultations with young people and making sure that they are a part of that and what they're saying truly is going into it because there's no point in asking young people what they want and not doing anything from it. We ensured that youth voice was still a priority in North Ayrshire through our youth forums, our youth execs uh, and young people's voices and working groups as well, you know, having that child-centred council approach and making sure they are included in it. And we also adapted to the new norm, stuff we'd never done before in our lives, you know, putting money into things that we didn't know was going to work. And I can honestly say in North Ayrshire, we have excelled at that. Not to sound too big-headed or anything like that, but we have. We've done well on it and we've the approach we've took is quite phenomenal. What's next for North Ayrshire? What's next? What are we going to do? So through the course of the school day work, we're going to continue to engage and put our report into action. Um, and we're excited to hold our first conference in the near future and bringing young people together to see how that's going to look. Putting policy into practice, practice, making sure our participation strategy is at the heart of everything we do. It's at the heart of our Child Centred Council, our UNCRC and the Scots Law, and how we're actually going to strengthen youth voice through that. You know, learning from the experience and continuously improving based on young people's feedback. And that's something we do in North Ayrshire. We constantly get feedback and we make sure what we're doing is right. Because as much as, you know, there's a small group of us, we're affecting and having that impact on a wider range of young people. We want to create a better life in that aspect of nothing about us without us. And my wee quote that I always like to go by is for young people and by young people and making sure we're actually taking them on that journey. As someone once told me, uh, youth work in North Ayrshire is like getting on a bus. Um, we'll get you to your destination, but you can get off at any time and we're here to support you through that. My experience personally at youth work, it's, it's been one that can be generic for young people and, you know, just that general youth work and going into it. But for me, I know a lot of other of my colleagues, it's been an experience one and one of the experience of uniqueness and how it's allowed me to gain confidence in ways I never would have before. Network and meet with people I wouldn't have had the opportunity to. Nice to meet everybody tonight as well. Challenge policy and influence decision making from within our like, change makers and the people that are actually creating the change and making sure young people are led in that. It's gave me the platform to raise youth voice, show people young people are the future. We're already here, active in our communities. We're ready to get stuck in and we're actively adapting and changing to what we are faced with each and every day. On to the next slide, please, Audrey. So what are our key learning points from this? What have we actually learned from the whole pandemic? In North Ayrshire, the people that came together to support each other was breathtaking. How, you know, the numbers we were able to reach and the people we had in and out of our centres making sure that people were fed people got their medications and people had that support in place. It, it, took, it took us back a bit and I'm sure Audrey will agree with me on that. As much as we took seven leaps forward in North Ayrshire, it gave us an opportunity to sit back a few steps to see where the real change was needed and how we develop services and initiatives in the light of COVID recovery. We learned more about what we can do to support and allowed us to operationalise support mechanisms in the aid of the COVID recovery and how that's going to look across our authority and hopefully what people can take on from the work we have done and influence that throughout Scotland. 
and also hopefully the UK as well. And just nicely we'll go on, and this will lead on to what Audrey's will come on to, and how the need for kindness and positive well-being is crucial in the work we do, and how that impacts and shapes our lives, not only as young people, not only as customers, but as citizens, and how that's going to look forward in our future. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. I'm sure we'll come back on at the end, but I'll pass back over to Audrey to continue with the presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you, Justin. I suppose I would like to say at this stage, before any of us get any older, um, I think Justin has probably just demonstrated to you why in my role as Director of Communities and Education in North Ayrshire, I probably have the best job in the world. When you see the the links that we make both intentionally and otherwise coming together and when you see Justin's reflection of how our worlds collide, um, it makes me so proud to be in North Ayrshire and very grateful to Education Scotland for giving us the opportunity tonight to, to share that with you. So, what I'd like to do now is perhaps just um, see a couple of different approaches that we've taken in North Ayrshire um, through a lens of challenging the status quo. So I've spoken at length about our relationship with our citizens. Justin's spoken about um, his perception of that and his role in that and the learning that he has um, endeavoured, I suppose, to share through a young person's lens. One of the things in North Asia that we have not been afraid to do over the, the past few years has been, um, I think, to be honest about the situation that we find ourselves in and how we are desperate, and I, I use that word really advisedly, we are desperate to look at all the levers and drivers that we can find to improve the socio-economic situation of the people that we serve in North Ayrshire. The recent Fraser of Allender report indicated that in terms of the socio-economic situation, particularly in relation to um, the economic situation, North Ayrshire is probably the weakest economy in Scotland. And that has an impact both on the quality of life of the people who live here and also, I think, um, the perception, including the self-perception of, of our communities. And that's something that we, and they, challenge day and daily. So we've worked deliberately with a, a wide range of partners and looked really critically at the kind of approaches we could bring to actually shifting the dial. Our Local Outcome Improvement Plan is called Fair for All and that really underpins, as Justin said, that determination to try to create more equity than exists already. So one of the, the, the more radical things that we've done in recent times is to have a very close working relationship with Carnegie UK. And from that perspective, we've been the overall Carnegie UK test site for place-based kindness. And we've also been one of the, the lead partners in their overall kindness innovation network. And when I was first invited to, to lead this work with North Ayrshire and Carnegie, I think there was a perception that that would be a kind of irrelevant, fluffy and perhaps fairly um, low level discussion that might or might not contribute to improving outcomes for people. There was also a perception that this would relate to, I think, what has been quite a trendy approach to kindness, which has been a sort of random acts. Um, approach where absolutely we all agree that being kind to each other is critically important and I spoke already as did Justin about the relationships and the trust but what we and Carnegie were much more interested in was organisational kindness so with individual kindness and community kindness but um, organisational kindness particularly in um, a, an emergency situation 
can be a real driver in terms of shifting the dial around how organisations act in a kind way. And that was really kind of the focus of where we were. So we worked um, in depth with young people, both across the youth services and the schools, to listen to what would make us a kind organisation and what would contribute to increased kindness in communities. So we did extensive engagement and we also did an awful lot of self-reflection across the community planning partnership. And what we did eventually was um, agree across the board that we would commit to a kindness promise. And again, I've showed you a timeline there of the work we've done with Carnegie um, around not just kindness, but around the enabling state, around the response to the pandemic. A lot of that work with Julia Unwin in the social policy context um, has really, I think, affected how we and our partners think in North Ayrshire. And you'll see some of the quotes and the comments there from that work. So... Moving into that really hard territory of performance and the value of public service and relationships, how can being an intentionally kind organisation and partnership contribute to that um, to these outcomes? And that relates back to the case studies that I spoke about in the context of the pandemic. How could we actually adapt services? in a way that very clearly and transparently makes organisational changes that affect people's lives. <coughs> Excuse me. I won't labour all of the comments there, I'm sure you can see them. But critically, I think, um, in the review of the responses to the pandemic that Carnegie published, they said about us that Community Hubs emerged as a place-based model that facilitated multi-stakeholder collaboration and allowed a more flexible and responsive approach to supporting people. So from a concept that started as a connected communities, and, and that's what we call our community services in North Asia, from something that started as a connected communities endeavour to support people where they were on a face-to-face -face basis in an emergency situation. We've learned that that approach can be developed into something much more than some of its parts and that embeds radical kindness all the way down from the top and allows leaders at all levels, particularly in communities. And Justin is the best example we have of this. How did our community hubs emerge stronger and led by our communities in a way that we could only have imagined. So across North Ayrshire, um, hubs like Fullerton Community Centre, Vineborough Community Centre, Whitley's Community Centre, Bridge End, right across the spectrum, community leaders took up the mantle and have actually rebalanced how services are delivered in these communities. Um, and we have been learning at their feet since then. And one of the things that I would like to mention in this context has been the rapid development of the food system that we already had in place in North Ayrshire. So again, from a position of delivering food from the council and partners to residents, we now have a network of over 20 organisations who in their own different ways, through larders and shops, um, deliver with our skills a powerful food system that enables people um, to access food without stigma in their own communities and from and with the people that they live with and are comfortable with. So that permission to act, that I hate using the word empowerment because we don't empower anybody, we only help to support and enable people to do what they want to do. But that business of putting power in people's hands, that for us is the heart of what radical kindness is about. So the interpersonal stuff and the community-based stuff is all part of it. But actually, it is that commitment to changing how we do things on a permanent basis that actually 
takes us into that radical space. And you'll recognise um, some of the work of, of people like Julia Unwin and Hilary Cotton in that mix, both of whom have been great supporters of our work, but certainly across the community and education dimension, um, our values, and I think it's really important to say this, our values have been reflected across a whole range of services and partners um, who were looking for a, a space, I guess, to demonstrate these values. So again, um, the, the presentations here, I think the six propositions for building back better is really interesting there because that, if you like, is the mirror image nationally that you, Carnegie UK identified as the learning from the pandemic. And you know that I started off the presentation with our learning from the pandemic. And I think that there's a real articulation there. Um, but certainly from a North Ayrshire perspective with um, unashamedly and without any apologies, a value-leading perspective um, as well, because the two have come together for all of us, I think, in the pandemic. So just one or two other things. I, I recognise that, that time is short now. I wanted to highlight to you just um, several other approaches that we continue to work on in North Ayrshire to, if you like, shift that dial. So. I'm privileged to lead the Child Poverty Action Plan and reporting in North Ayrshire. And um, we all have a responsibility to, to work in that space. When we did our first Child Poverty Action Plan and report, North Ayrshire was recognised as, as an extremely um, effective and I suppose well articulated report. And I was asked to go from I don't know, COSLA to SOLAS to Children's Services Planning and Government. I was asked to speak in a lot of different fora about what we were doing in North Ayrshire around child poverty. And that in itself was, was a great thing to be able to do. But the thing that really kept me awake at night was the fact that we had what was perceived as one of the best approaches to child poverty in North Asia, but in actual fact, we weren't making the difference that we need to make. And that's still the case and for the foreseeable future. That is bound to still be the case, given the, the, the situation that, that we're in. However, what I would say is we do continue to look at child poverty and indeed poverty across um, the local authority through the lens of radical kindness, but also through some other radical approaches, one of which is the basic income feasibility work that we're involved in just now, and you may have heard of that. So how do we ensure that citizens have enough of an underpinning, if you like, in their economic life to be able to pursue their aspirations perhaps either in their personal or their working or their family lives. And that for us is an area um, that through the pandemic we recognised would have addressed a lot of the economic uncertainty being experienced in a really fluctuating set of circumstances. That links very closely with the inclusive growth diagnostic work that we've done, which is about ensuring that all of the economic opportunities, including the Ayrshire Growth Deal in North Ayrshire, can benefit all of the people in our communities. So not a trickle-down economic development approach, but an inclusive development, economic development approach. And again, that factors into that overall learning from the pandemic. How do we target those in our communities who most need economic development support. And we've done that recently, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to working with people with disabilities and women, women, including women in low paid work. So again, in relation, I'm sorry, as you can hear, I have a cold folks. In relation to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. A couple of things that I want to draw your attention to. The recent Audit Scotland Accounts Commission report around improving um, outcomes for young people through education, I think, have brought together all the themes that Justin and I have discussed today. So how does closing the education relation 
education related attainment gap sit within the context of all of the other pieces of work, the levers and drivers that I spoke about, the different approaches that I spoke about. How do we knit all of that together into a whole systems approach to make sure that one thing impacts on the next in a way that is really well considered by all parties and can make maximum impact? So how does that space in which we all come together in collaboration. How can we plan intentionally for that to have the biggest impact? And that's my, I think, my biggest area of interest at the moment. How do we make sure that Christie becomes a reality post-pandemic? And I'd just like to finish by saying that I'm sure a number of the authorities here will be um, attainment, um, Scottish Attainment Challenge authorities. And we're really proud in North Ayrshire that our recent data shows that we have actually been able, particularly in S3, to make a real impact on that poverty-related attainment gap. And, and some of our head teachers are here today. Um, and again, I would absolutely take my hat off to the connected communities teams, the education teams in North Asia, who've worked tirelessly together to make that impact. And it's that impact that working through the whole system in a climate of kindness and trust allows us to do. So I'd like to just finish off by saying a huge thank you for allowing us to explore uh, what makes us tick in North Ayrshire, the learning that we've experienced through the pandemic. And some of that, I think, um, has allowed us to expose our weaknesses, as well as some of the areas where I think we do have strengths. And I know that anyone else in this space would have relished the opportunity to do the same thing. So thank you for allowing it to be us. Um, and thank you to all the colleagues that I work with day and daily for um, making North Ayrshire the place it is. And a special thanks to Justin. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. And thanks everyone as well for having us here. Thanks. Thank you so much, both, both Audrey and Justin. I think everybody on the call will agree that that was just fantastic to hear. Um, and, I, and I know that you both could have spoken for all day around the work going on in North Ayrshire. So it was just great to hear a bit of a snapshot. I know we've only got four minutes left, but I'm going to be really cheeky and try and sneak in a couple of questions because there's a couple of people with their hands up. Um, so the question, I think the first person would be one of your colleagues. So Pam Crossway, did you have a question or a comment to make? No, sorry, it's been, I didn't mean to put my hand up. Sorry about that. That's I don't know okay, that happened. No, sorry. No I thought it was maybe just to... It was a great presentation, though. Thank you. I thought it was maybe just to remind Justin that he'd forgotten you, because I saw that in the chat, <laughs> putting your hand up. Um, I think, Jim, Jim Duffy, are you still there? You had your hand up, but it might have gone down now. He's maybe had to go. No, he's still here, but the hand shouldn't have gone up. <laughs> That's OK. Well, I do, I do know... I don't know if... Um, Karen's on the call anymore or not, but we did have a, a question in advance from somebody, um, which you might both be able to just give a really quick um, answer to. It's quite specific around how can what community learning and development partners offer be better understood and included? Um, so not an easy question, but I don't know if either of you have got a, quick, a wee answer for that one. Justin, I think you should go first because we spoke about this today at Joint Cabinet, didn't we? Um, how we can, well, use some of the, the mechanisms for young people. Mm. Sorry, wait, again, Susan. What was that, sorry? It was how can CLD partners um, kind of put across their offer? How can they get that understood of what they what they do? You know, I, I guess the kind of the, the approach we've always tried tried to take in, in North, North Ayrshire and what we've you know tried to work towards is that one stop shop and making sure that not only young people but everyone have the, the one place to go to where they can get all the information. And CLD, as much as sometimes it can be a bit hidden in the background, and for young people especially, they're not kind of through mainstream education in a sense. But how? the impact that they're having just now creates and stems from all these different services within the council and how it really adds on to it is phenomenal. But I, I think the, the way that they can kind of work more embedded 
would be through getting to know the young people as they would do and having that reach within schools as well because it's the main place they can get them. But definitely, no, it's a good question. Thank you very much. I think that was, that was a very good answer. Roger, have you got something to add? Yeah, I, I was just going to, um, I suppose, um, agree with that, Susan, but also to say that we always say in CLD that actually um, the, the CLD approach, as you well know, shouldn't have capital letters attached to, to the description of CLD. And actually, that approach should be about how we work with our partners on a CLD basis. So our assumption would be that working across all of the partners using all of the, I suppose, um, relationships that we have, should be all of us taking that CLD approach. So, for example, the work that our colleague Anne-Marie leads around our work with New Scots, um, all of the people involved in that work are taking a CLD approach to reach the people who may not immediately be on the radar with or for CLD. So it's about sharing that approach with partners so that everyone is either implicitly or explicitly um, assuming and taking a CLD approach around capacity building, learning, empowerment, etc. And I think it's, it's that issue about who we are as opposed to what we do. And that's something that Angela leading the CLD team in North Ayrshire absolutely, you know, um, lives by and I'm sure she could express it much better than I could. Thank you. I think that's a, a fantastic note to end on. Um, really, really appreciate both your time this afternoon and everybody on the call. Thank you for joining us. Um, unless anybody has any burning questions, I know that colleagues have put the evaluation in the chat pane. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, I think I, for one, would be advocating for more young people um, on these calls, given us their experience. It was fantastic to hear um, from you, Justin, but and you as well, Audrey. Thank you again. Um, it is five o'clock, so I hope you all have a lovely evening. It's lovely and sunny in Dundee. Hope it's the same where you are. Um, but enjoy your evening and we hope to see you again at another session soon. Thank you very much, folks.